Don't know the answer? Ask the Naked Scientists. Hello and welcome to this week's Ask the Naked Scientists with me, Sue Marchant, and Dave Ansell. What's new in the world of science for you, Dave? Well, an interesting story, which I think is um, fascinating and hopefully shows big things in the future, um, partly because I'm a space space geek, is that Elon Musk um, and his company SpaceX have managed to launch uh, his bigger space rocket, the Falcon 9, and actually get it into orbit. Um, uh, that's not doesn't sound very impressive. People have been doing this for ages, but this is essentially his own project. He decided a few years ago that getting into space was too expensive, so he made a load of money by selling PayPal uh, about ten years ago. And he thought, what can we do with all this money? Let's build a space program. So he's <laughs> basically built his own space program, and he's built a space rocket which is capable of launching um, about ten tons up into low Earth orbit. Wow! Which um, mostly I'm just really really impressed. That, that essentially you can just think let's build a space rocket <laughs> uh, and yeah he l- launched it last Friday um, it's, a very, it's actually quite unusual for space rockets to work the first time Ooh. he's got a smaller one called Falcon 1 which it worked on his fourth try um, but this bigger one he's got, managed to get to work fine um, and pe- apparently people in Australia thought it was a UFO because oh, wow. you know, the big sort of plume of the rocket as it flew up over he launched it in Florida but it was over Australia and um, there's a big glowing thing in the sky and various people um, reported UFO in the sky Amazing. Uh, when it was over the top and uh, hopefully in, it, the idea is that he's going to kind of cut the price of launching into space by a factor of three or four and hopefully that will lead to all sorts of interesting things because I think it's cheaper to do people do more interesting things with it Let's go to our first science questions for this evening. Um, How does anti-dandruff shampoo get rid of dandruff and what does it contain to do this? Dave? Not quite my area of expertise, but I think one of the things which can cause dandruff is if you get fungi um, in amongst your, uh, in, in your scalp. And, that, and the, one of your reactions to your scalp has to try and get rid of this fungus is grow lots of skin and then lose it quickly. Um, and so if you can kill that fungi, it can reduce the dandruff. And I think just physically getting rid of the dandruff while you're washing your hair so it falls out in the water rather than on everyone else or on your shoulders. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, yeah, I think basically killing off the, some of the things which are producing it and getting rid of it itself. Excellent. Let's go to our next question, which is coming by email uh, from William McCartney. What a great name. Um, And he just simply asks, because he's from Auckland, New Zealand, why do ships stay upright? Dave? Yeah, particularly modern ships, they look... Um, like they're huge, great high things. Actually, they, they don't they don't go down as deep as you'd expect them to be stable. Um, there's a couple of things which are going on. Um, one of them is that, especially monohull, single hull ships, um, have got lots and lots of ballast low down in the ship. So the centre of gravity, for a start, is much lower than it looks like it is. So it's naturally much more stable. Although the centre of gravity is still above the centre of buoyancy, so it can actually still tip over and capsize ships capsize. Um, but what happens is that as it capsizes, so if you imagine a ship and it rolls slightly to the right, um, if the sides are vertical, um, then that puts lots of extra ship underwater um, on the right-hand side of the ship. So that mm. produces lots more extra buoyancy on the right-hand side of the ship. Uh, and so that tends to tip it upright again. The extreme case of this is a catamaran, so you've got two hulls a long, long way apart. Mm. If you put extra weight on the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, then that just drops the right-hand hull a bit, and that gives you lots of extra buoyancy on the right-hand side, which tends to tip you the right way up. And so, for most ships, um, you've got they've got to tip them over a really, really long way, sort of beyond ninety degrees or about ninety degrees before they'll stop getting extra um, buoyancy um, on the side you're tipping them to, and they'll actually capsize all the way over. Um, some ships are less good at that than others, especially the old, some of the old naval ships with lots of tumble home. If you look at HMS Victory, the sides gets it gets narrower as you go up, and the Mary Rose was, had a big problem with this, mm. and they had too much weight too high up. So once it tipped beyond a certain point, which wasn't very far over, the amount of uprighting force, uh, the writing force, stopped increasing. At which point, it carries on tipping and falls over. Mm. All right. Leanne in Gillingham says, I had two balloons that I blew up and tied a knot. One went down and the other one didn't. So where does all the air go then, Dave? Where does the air go Mm. from a balloon? 
Um, the balloon, you know, the rubber's squashing it, putting it under pressure. Um, and actually, there's tiny, tiny holes in the rubber film around the outside. And that the air can just escape through those holes out into the atmosphere. So the air just escapes the atmosphere and the balloon goes down. Sometimes, particularly if it's quite cold, um, the balloons can actually... The rubber can almost crystallise. And it, the balloon will stay up, almost inflated. It's not like hard inflated, but it's sort of been roughly inflated for months and months and months. Um, and uh, which it stays that way until you touch it, at which point you heat up the rubber. You kind of... You're sort of... On some set, in some sense, you sort of melt the, um, the molecules a bit; they can move apart, and it shrinks down. Um, but I think basically the air sort of diffused out through the holes in the balloon. Mm. Now, Susie has sent me in quite a long question, Dave, actually, and it's a, a bit of an article about um, using microwave water and purified water, and in two instances, um, a plant, and I'll show you all of this, so if you come over here, which I know is bit quite bizarre, but uh, there they are, you see, one's microwave water and the one is purified water, um, and there's uh, some bits and pieces here. This is all to do with plants and how they are fed with this, and then um, she goes on to say about baby baby's milk being uh, warmed up in a microwave. Is microwave water safe? That's what she's actually saying <laughs> in one thing or another. What is your take on that, Dave? Um, I just said doing any experiments involving biology, I think what she's been trying to do is yeah. um, compare how water which has been boiled in a microwave to water which is boiled in a kettle yeah. and try watering plants with them and see if there's any difference. Yeah. Looking very quickly, I've only had a few seconds yeah. to have a look at it. Um, she's only done this with sort of one plant in each case. Yeah. Um, and the problem with biology is that this is I feel I'm very impressed by biologists in general. Is that in physics, if you design your experiment really well in general, you can it'll work and it it'll, it'll be do, do what you're expecting it to. If you're dealing with um, plants or mice, they can just decide to do something else. It's just such a complicated um, system that I mean things can keel over and die for any number of reasons. Um, so in order to actually do that experiment properly, you'd have to do tens of plants and also mix them up and mix them up at different times and make sure they're all in dip so you don't all, you don't put all of the because if you put all the microwave water um, plants nearer to the sun or further away from the sun right, yeah or you might overwater some or underwater others they might be slightly different genetically they might pick up pests diff differently so you've got to do lots of randomized trials the other big trick is to make sure you don't when you're the person who's growing the plants doesn't know whether, what kind of water they're adding to them so you need to give them water A and water B because otherwise subconsciously if you might um, water them slightly better or differently if you're thinking that, that water A is better than that if the microwave water is better or the non-microwave water is better so I think I'd have to see an awful lot more I haven't heard any evidence that microwaves do anything bad to water um, they can um, overheat it and superheat it um, which is why they're quite dangerous heating up coffee and you should be very careful about taking coffee out of... If you heat up coffee in a microwave, mm. you can actually get water above the boiling point of water and when you take it out, it can suddenly boil in your, and explode in your face. Mm. So you've got to be very careful about that. But um, once it's cooled down, I've certainly never heard of anything wrong with it. I can't see any reason why it would be mm. wrong. All right, Susie, well, I hope that answers your question. Let's go to the phones now because we've got Dave in Dis who is on the line. Hello, Dave. Hi, Sue. Hello, you are through to Dr. Dave. What's your question? Somebody just said something about balloons, and it made something click in my head. <laughs> um, weather balloons, yeah? Yeah. What are they made of? Some of them are just big rubber balloons. <laughs> and they're just like giant... I mean, when they're not blown up, they're sort of about a metre across, and they'll inflate to sort of ten times that size. And th those are kind of a more old-fashioned version ones. I think the really high-altitude ones are some either polythene sheet or some kind of very thin plastic. Yeah. They're not stretchy, so they start off em almost empty. And as the pressure drops, the helium inside them expands and fills them right the way up. So that's the reason they look so floppy, is because they're almost empty to start with. Because you've got to have all the space for that helium to expand by a factor of 100 or so as it rises up into the upper atmosphere and the stratosphere. What happens to the expensive equipment? What's on them? Because do they track it or something? And they track them. I th it, d I mean, it depends on if it's cheap equipment, then I think possibly they just let it go. But I think they put parachutes on them. 
and quite a lot of weather balloons just go up and up and up until they pop because the pressure outside drops enough that it can't hold together. It pops, a parachute comes out and it floats down to the, to the ground and then someone in a car chases after it and hope they can find it again. OK, cheers, thanks a lot. Dave, cheers. thank you very much. Bye. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. Let's go to this one now. This has come from uh, David Great Yarmouth. He says, What is the deepest distance man has travelled into the Earth's core? As I've read an unsubstantiated claim about entrances to the deep inner parts of the Earth from the North Pole region. Ooh, Dave, how exciting. Does, what do you reckon? Uh, um, as far as we know, the deepest a person has ever been down is down the bottom of the Tautona mine in South Africa. Um, which is about 3.6 kilometres down, and down there it gets really hot. It's up to sort of 55 degrees centigrade because you're starting to get closer to the mantle and the hot molten rocks. Um, there's lots of radioactive decay going on in the granites around there, and it gets very hot. If the deepest anything made by man has gone down, um, the Russians have bored a borehole down to like an um, oil drilling type piece of equipment down about 12 and a quarter kilometres in the 1980s uh, just in order to look what's down there and take samples there's stories of hollow things at the North Pole, I've certainly never heard anything about it you could detect any large voids underground ground because it would there'd be less gravity over them and there are lots of very very sensitive satellites which fly around the earth and they're sensitive enough to pick up sort of bodies of different types of rock mm. they can easily pick up mountains and they could certainly pick up giant caves under the north or south pole so I don't, I don't think there is anything down there I'm afraid and we're going to go to the phones because we've got uh, Mark in Dunstable on the line hello Mark hello Sue hello, hello Dave ben. you're through to Dr hello. Dave what's your question I was watching a programme I've, I've known this for some years but the scorpions you use a UV light and they glow. And um, I heard even today, if you find a fossilised scorpion, and uh, it still glows. And I was wondering, has the Earth perhaps been hit by high levels of radiation right back 430 million years ago? I mean, the glowing is unrelated to radiation, I think. It's just they happen to have a molecule inside them which, when it's hit by ultraviolet light, it converts that ultraviolet light into visible light we can see. Various other things have it as well. But white bananas, apparently, have a um, pigment in them which glow as well. White bananas? White bananas. Um, your teeth will glow in ultraviolet slightly yeah. as well. Um, certainly washing powders do. It's not very natural. Um, various other things do. Um, I don't think it's uh, a particularly evolved for things. It's just various chemical molecules do. Quinine as well does, mm. which is the reason if you've ever been um, in a club or something um, or a disco and you've had a, um, a gin and tonic, <laughs> um, the quinine, because quinine is an anti-malarial and the, the tonic, it was given to Jesuit. people oh, to stop yeah. people getting malaria. And I don't think any of that is due to any kind of evolutionary thing. It's just that it happens that some organic molecules happen to glow. Partly, I guess, the first bombs were somewhere pretty much in the middle of nowhere, so there wasn't a lot else other than scorpions and cockroaches mm. kicking about. Mm. I mean, it depends how close you are. I mean, in some places, like um, around Chernobyl, apparently the environment, uh, the sort of natural environment is doing beautifully, wonderfully, because mm. there's no humans there. Um, we've stopped farming and we've stopped spreading pesticides all over the place. And the, I mean, the creatures probably don't live quite as long and there's more mutations. But overall, the ecosystem is doing quite well. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't think there's any kind of evolutionary reason why they would glow or any particular reason to have high radiation tolerance. The radiation does go up a bit, for example, when the... Because we're protected from cosmic radiation by the Earth's magnetic field. And when the um, Earth's magnetic field fl flips, the magnetic, f magnetic field gets a lot weaker and you would get more radiation then. But, yeah, I don't know of any definite things recently of there being very high levels of radiation. OK, Mark? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> If you're enjoying Ask the Naked Scientist, then you might like to check out The Naked Scientist, our regular roundup of the world's best science. Each week we take a look at the latest science news, talk to top researchers working at the coalface of discovery, and also get our hands dirty with a science experiment that you can join in with too. So make it a date and prepare to strip down science on the web at nakedscientist.com slash podcast. 
Um, our next question comes again by email from uh, Ricky, and he says, can light be redshifted out of the visible, visible range? Yeah, um, redshifting is basically, it's a bit like, uh, it's a kind of Doppler shift. It's a bit like um, the, the sound equivalent of it is if you've ever cycled past um, someone making a noise, uh, the bleepers, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you'd never do anything like this. Me, if no. you've ever, ever cycled past the bleepers <laughs> on a Pelican Crossing, yeah. you cycle past those, um, you'll notice the pitch is high when you come towards them and it suddenly yeah. drops as you go past. That's because as you're moving towards the sound, the pitch is increased. As you're moving away, the pitch is decreased. Um, the same thing happens with light due to a slight a similar effect, but it's not quite the same. Um, if something's moving towards you, its wavelength gets shorter and it get, the light gets bluer. If it's get moving away, the wavelength gets longer and the light gets redder. Um, and you can certainly get redshifts big enough to move things out of the visible spectrum. Mm. Um, in fact, what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation, um, which is a kind of background glow in the whole of the universe, which is far, far into the issues in the microwave, which is far beyond the red end of the visible spectrum, started off the other side of the visible spectrum, right up in the gamma rays region. And so it's been um, redshifted far, far more than across the visible spectrum. So, yes, quite easily, although the, to get the speeds required to do that haven't been around in the universe for a while. All right, let's go to our phones again. And a very good evening to Tony. Hi, Tony. Good evening, Sue. Hey, we love to hear from you, Tony. Hey, hey. what's your question? Uh, desert, you get the sun on the sand and you get, uh, you can't see properly, can you? It's or on a shimmering. road, like a, a tarmac road, the sun goes on that. I just wondered what it's doing to the atmosphere to make you see, make... Uh, oh, yeah, when you get that fuzziness, don't you? Yeah. It goes sort of fuzzy, doesn't it? It's sort yeah. of shimmery. Yeah. What's going on here is the sun's beating down, heating up the ground. The ground's getting very, very hot. The air's transparent, so it doesn't absorb very much heat, so the air higher up is still quite cold. The, so the air near the ground gets heated up by the hot ground, and hot air expands. And that means that light goes through it slightly faster. And where this hot, and this hot air rises, and where the light um, hit goes between the cold air and the hot air, it bends slightly. Uh -huh. In the same way as light, when it goes from air into glass, it bends slightly. So if you look refraction. through... Refraction. Refracts, that's right. So if you look through a glass, everything looks slightly distorted behind it. Indeed. So this hot air um, is refracting the air, and because the air is hot and moving and kind of it's very turbulent, it's sort of all swirly, yeah. um, the, the route at which it's being refracted changes all the time. So the, the light getting to you is coming from different places all the time, it's changing over time, and it shimmers. It's also the reason why stars twinkle. Oh. Because ah. um, if, if you've got a whole atmosphere to go through, you get little um, temperature changes in the air up high. Mm -hmm. And the light um, can either get sort of um, focused down onto your eye, um, so it's got concentrated into your eye, in which case the star gets a bit um, brighter, or it gets um, defocused from your eye, in which case it gets a bit dimmer and it can move a little bit. And so it's the same effect for stars twinkling. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Lovely to hear from you as well. And you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Um, one quick one here from Keith in Peterborough. Dave, he asks, um, why do helicopter rotors or aeroplane propellers seem to be stationary or even going in reverse when they're going at full speed? I think this is related to when you've got a wheel, the same thing, wheels look like they're going the wrong direction. Um, the biggest place you see it is on film or on TV. Mm. And film or TV are taking a picture um, every, with film it's 25 a second, with TV in this country it's 50 a second. So you're taking lots of pictures. And so if you're looking at something which is doing the same thing again and again and mm. again, so if you imagine a propeller going round, if, if the propeller does a, exactly one turn every time you take a, take a picture then every picture you'll see the propeller in the same place. So it will look completely stationary. If the propeller does slightly less than a whole turn um, every time the camera takes a picture, each time you take it, the propeller will move backwards a little bit, so it will look like it's um, rotating backwards slowly. And if it does slightly more than a full turn, then it will look like it's turning forward slightly. Um, it's a, called a stroboscopic effect, I think. Um, I don't think you get it with even lighting. You sometimes get a similar thing um, with street lights because street lights f flicker a little bit. 
but I don't think it's an effect you actually see with even lighting, um, actually with your eyes, because your eyes don't have this kind of um, repeated um, picture taking like a video camera. Um, Mike in Colchester has asked, um, we cry with laughter, we cry in despair, and we, why should we cry at all? Are we the only species that cries, Dave? Um, lots of species produce tears. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that many. I it's not my area, but I haven't heard of any others which do it kind of in a, for the social function. Mm. Um, normally, tears are there to keep your eye clean. If you get some, if you get something nasty mm. in your eye, then you cry. Mm. Yeah, if you get um, when you're chopping onions, that kind of crying is yeah. what it's designed for to get yeah. the nasty compounds, the uh, volatile compounds which evaporate off the onion into your eye, which are quite nasty and painful. They do to wash them out of your eye. Um, also bacteria and things like that um, but I haven't heard of any other animals um, which use it in a social um, context to indicate that they're upset or any kind of emotion hmm. Alright, well Pete has sent a question in, is there any correlation between gravity, electromagnetism and just the magnetism that you get from a normal magnet Okay, electromagnetism, um, it basically if you have an electric current going through a wire, for any electric current, um, that will produce a magnetic field. Um, this is actually to do with relativity. Um, Einstein explained this about 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was how he worked out relativity in the first place, one of the th things. Um, it's basically uh, the same way that you may have heard that things get heavier when they go near the speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, and their charge also changes a little bit. You need this little correction to electric charge um, when things are moving um, because of relativity. And that correct correction we call magnetism. So electricity and magnetism are very related. And the magnetism which you, um, in a bar magnet, is essentially due to electric currents which are permanently flowing around the atoms, in around the iron atoms inside that bar magnet. So it's exactly the same as an electromagnet. It's just they're, it, they're continuously going. It's electrons orbiting around um, iron, atom, uh, iron atoms inside the magnet. Um, relationship to gravity... There are lots and lots and lots of physicists trying to come up with a theory which combines electromagnetism and gravity and the other two big forces in the universe, um, the strong, the two, two nuclear forces called the strong and weak nuclear force. Um, and there's various theories which have con connected um, electromagnetism and the strong and weak magnetic, um, nuclear forces, but no one's done it successfully and found evidence for it working with gravity. So it's a big question. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Uh, Jeff in Ipswich sent an email in saying, on the subject of helicopters, is it true that they are limited to a certain speed due to their aerodynamics, or is it something else? That's from Jeff in Ipswich. Thank you, Jeff. Um, the big limit on the speed a helicopter can go is that the way a helicopter gets lift is you've got a rotor um, going in circles, yep. um, and because it's basically a wing um, which is moving in circles all the time, and for that wing to generate lift, it's got to be moving through the air. Um, now, when you start moving forwards, the half of the rotor, which is moving in the same direction as the helicopter, compared to the air, is now getting going extra fast, and the part of the rotor, which is going backwards, is moving in the same direction as the air, is moving past the helicopter, so relatively it's going slower through the air. So you get extra lift off the side which is going forwards and less lift off the side which is going backwards. And when you get to the point of the rotor going at the, the rotor going at the same speed as a helicopter's moving through the air, mm -hmm. then the side which is moving backwards isn't moving relative to the air, and it's not going to get, get any lift at all. So unless so, the helicopter is going to fall over sideways because it's getting lots of lift on one side and no lift on the other, and it can't stay stable. So unless you can get your lift from somewhere else, there are some people who've done it by having. Um, wings on your helicopter mm. so you can get your lift from the wing um, the Russians did it with a helicopter where you have two um, rotor blades going in opposite directions mm. so both of the rotor blades, half the rotor blades producing lift um, but they're on opposite sides of the helicopter mm -hmm. so that's fine and you can continue producing lift so I think that's a fundamental limit on speed limit on helicopters. The mm. other limit is the um, if the rotor blades start going faster than the speed of sound that can cause problems because um, that changes the aerodynamics entirely Wow. All right, well, let's go to uh, more aerodynamics here. Um, Tony, who's uh, in um, Pennsylvania in the US. Hi, Tony, sent an email. Could a large enough fan propel a space shuttle? 
Um, the problem with you, the way a fan works um, to move you through, through the air, just like a helicopter, it moves through the air, deflects the air, pushes the air backwards, and you get an equal opposite force. Uh, every action has an equal opposite reaction, as Isaac Newton worked out. So if the fan is pushing the air backwards, then the air is pushing the fan forwards, so the fan moves through the air. Problem in space, um, even where the space shuttle is, which is quite low down, you're essentially in a vacuum. There's almost no air molecules up there. There's only a few air molecules per cubic metre um, up at the altitudes of the space shuttle. And a fan, you just could, there's just not enough air to push back to be able to get any significant force. If you go much higher than the space shuttle, there's virtually nothing. So, unfortunately, it wouldn't really work. <laughs> Um, why should it be possible, says, Mark, says uh, Mike, um, to sharpen a cutthroat razor on a leather strap? I've always wondered that. Well, I guess it's just um, when you're sharpening something, you start off with a coarse yeah. um, stone or something, yeah. and then you slowly go through finer and finer stones. So you're taking less and less off to just get a very, very final, very, very smooth, sharp edge. And a leather strop is going to be slightly slightly abrasive, only very slightly, and also it will tend to bend the metal into a straight line. And so I think it's just doing the very, very last bit of sharpening. Mm. Um, does a torch light... Uh, sorry, does light from a torch propel the torch backwards? That's from Ben. The simple answer is yes. Um, light, although when it's stationary, it doesn't have any mass because light has energy, it has momentum as well. Um, and therefore when you set photons away from a torch it will get pushed back very very slightly but the amount is minute in sort of far less than picanewtons tiny tiny amounts It's you couldn't measure it with um, virtually anything you might be able to measure the force from the light hitting something else but I doubt you can measure the force on the torch but yes it does produce a force hmm. Alright, we've got time for one or two more uh, this is from Martin from Sweden. I'm a bit concerned about this, Martin. Um, what would happen if I put my laptop into a tub of deionized water? OK. Um, if you put your laptop in a tub of normal water, mm. the problem is that water conducts electricity. It also um, encourages all sorts of... Um, basically, there's lots of different metals inside your laptop. Um, and the water, basically you've got more than one metal connected together, you have a battery and the water completes a circuit, it forms, create, is an electrolyte, and so lots of battery circuits go on, it's called galvanic action, inside your laptop and it corrodes all sorts of things and causes complete chaos. Um, deionized water um, doesn't conduct electricity, there's no ions in it, there's nothing dissolved in it, so it can't conduct electricity, Very, it's almost not at all. Um, and so it is actually pretty much an insulator. It, unless there's anything on your laptop which would dissolve in the deionized water, it should be fine. Now, don't quote me on that and don't try it and certainly don't sue me if it goes wrong. Um, I do know that there's a lovely story about uh, which my girlfriend's dad, who was a physicist in Oxford a while ago, um, tells of apparently they had lots of capacitors using huge voltages. And the fire inspectors came round and they, they were talking about 50,000 volts or something. And, and they said, oh, it's a good thing you've got no water lying around. What they didn't tell the fire inspectors <laughs> was that in between the plates, the capacitors it was all full of water. Because it was very, very pure deionized water, it didn't conduct electricity and you don't have a problem with mixing water and electricity. But um, if there's anything which could dissolve off your laptop, it could cause havoc. So I wouldn't try it. No, please don't. Now, um, Cathy in Spalding says, why does it look like there are puddles on the road in hot weather? Very true. Good question. That's a lovely question. Um, mirages is the reason. Um, very, very hot air. Um, it, as I was saying earlier, it's less dense and it's less optically dense as well, so light refracts. If you get a layer of hot air above the road... Um, then light, when it comes down from the sun, or from, the, in fact, normally from the blue sky, comes down, it hits this um, hotter air, it goes slightly faster, and what it does, it bends upwards. So it can bend round a corner up into your eyes. And so it looks like you can see the sky, basically you can see an image of the sky mm. on, in the road. Mm. And the only other thing which you could ever see, which where you see a picture of the sky in the road, 
is a reflection from a puddle. So it looks like a puddle, but actually it's a mirror. The same thing happens in the desert. That's it for this week. Our doctors will be back with me next week for more Ask the Naked Scientist. But don't forget you can also catch them on the Naked Scientist podcast, which you can find on the Naked Scientist website, www.nakedscientist.com. The Naked Scientists are sponsored by the Wellcome Trust, the EPSRC and UK Fast. For more information, look us up online at nakedscientists.com. <laughs> <laughs>